I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 6. That's where we will be in just a moment. So today what we're going to address, though, is uh, what I I recently just read this study um, from a group of millennials uh, who are non-Christian. So non-Christian millennials, the millennial generation is roughly, let's say, 18 years old to about 30-something, 35, somewhere in there. And uh, a series, uh, a study on these non-Christian millennials and what they thought about Christianity. And 90% of them said that Christians are too judgmental. So... That's their opinion, and this is a generation that is, is, will soon be the dominant generation, uh, in our country at least. So 90% think that Christians are too d- judgmental. So today, as we go through this series and this passage that we'll look at today, we're going to address two questions. One is, are Christians too judgmental? And then the second thing we're going to address is, is it okay to make any sort of judgments about morality and right and wrong? And then, um, and after about five minutes, we should be done, because this isn't relevant. So, um, <laughs> now obviously today, this is a, a very pertinent topic that we want to look at. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, and see what Jesus uh, has to instruct us. So pray with me as we get started. God, we thank you so much for today. And uh, I thank you that you do not leave us alone, that uh, to kind of figure out life, and uh, you've left us with your word, you've blessed us with your spirit to lead us and to instruct us in uh, a history and a legacy of faith that we can lean on. So we thank you, and I pray now, God, that this would be all about you, and that this time would honor you and lift you up. In your name, amen. So as we get started here, uh, just to, we want to get caught up a little bit on where we are. So this section of scripture here in Luke chapter 6 is Jesus has been instructing, and it's a long kind of section of his teaching. It was some, the parallel passage in the book of Matthew is a sermon on the mount. So whether it was one teaching or this is just a common theme that he taught often, it doesn't matter. But these are, these are Jesus' instructions about what does life in the kingdom of God look like? What is life in the kingdom of God and how it's different than life in the kingdom of man? And so that's what we are looking at. And there's a couple things that we noticed. A couple weeks ago, uh, Matt was teaching and we looked over the, uh, what's called the Beatitudes. It says, blessed are the poor, the hungry, and, uh, and, and those who, when you face discomfort or pain, and those when you're rejected for Christ. And what we found there is in the kingdom of God that it redefines where we find our purpose and our fulfillment. So in the kingdom of God, we no longer need to find our fulfillment in riches, in power, in material comforts. We don't need it in acceptance from others. We don't need it in avoidance of pain. Now, none of those things are bad. I I personally don't mind a life where I avoid pain and where I'm accepted and and all of these things. But the life in the kingdom of God means that we we are redefined in those because we have an eternal view, that those things don't cause our day to have a good week, a bad week, a good month, a bad month, because we find all that we need in Christ and in his kingdom, not in the kingdom of man. So it redefines where we find our purpose and our fulfillment. And the thing we looked at last week is life in the kingdom of God redefines uh, how and who we love. How and who we love. See, in the normal heart of humanity, in the way we normally are, is we have no problem loving people who love us back or who loved us first. And Jesus actually was addressing this idea of, you can think of it, the law of reciprocity. And it's the, the tendency for mankind to, to treat others as they treat you. And so it's easy to love someone who loves you or will love you. It's easy to forgive someone who has forgiven you, those kind of things. But he addresses it and says the kind of love in the kingdom of God is unconditional, no strings attached. We don't love to get love, and we don't love because we have been loved by someone else. We love, well, ultimately because God loves us, and we now are in his kingdom, but it's an unconditional love. Now, who do we love? Again, it's very natural for us, our hearts. It's no problem to to love our family most of the time, uh, to love our neighbors most of the time, to love those in our tribe, if you want to think of it that way. But Jesus said, okay, the people you love are not just those inside. It's, uh, you need to love the enemy. You need to love those who hate you, who do harm to you, who persecute you. It is a radical kind of love. So life in the kingdom of God is, redefines how and who we love. Now this week, we're going to look at life in the kingdom of God redefines how and who we judge. Doesn't that sound great? We get to find out how and who we judge this week. And so it's a, it, like I said, it's a, life t- uh, a light topic. 
And it's one that actually, as I studied and kept preparing, I realized that we we're going to talk about it this week and next week uh, because I think judging is so fun. So uh, we are, uh, we're going to look at that and see what does Jesus actually instruct us about how and who we love. So let's get into the text for today and read what we will be studying. Luke chapter 6. We're going to pick it up in verse 36 because it's important to have verse 36 to understand verse 37. So verse 36, Jesus ends last week's message and said, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you won't be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. They'll pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now, Jesus is addressing, first of all, just a little bit of, to understand the wording here. He's, he's doing two things. One, he's talking about, again, this law of reciprocity. A general human condition where if you, if you forgive Often that person's more willing to forgive you. If you don't judge someone, they might not judge you. If you pardon someone, they're more willing to, I already said that one, but pardon you. And, and then he uses this terminology of, which actually gets very confusing in the Greek to understand what it's talking about. It said, they will give to you a measure that's pressed down and shaken together until it pours over. And this is a picture of actually in a marketplace when you're filling up a basket of wheat. Um, maybe for those of you who, who bake today, you know if you scoop some flour and you kind of shake it down to, to get it to fill in. That's what he's saying is actually there's something that's going to be given to you that's kind of pressed down and shaken and overflowing. And it's this idea of this abundance of good measure that's poured out to you. Now, some of your Bibles just say it will be given to you. Some of your Bibles have the word they in there. And most likely what it's referring to is that last piece is something that's given to you by God. That God is some, pouring over some sort of press down, something that he's given to you, which I believe is part of this abundant life in the kingdom. Not material possessions, not even a spiritual, like, oh, now I have more gold or spiritual gold, but it's this life in Christ is poured out and overflowing. You're experiencing this abundance, this, this blessing in this life. So he's kind of addressing some human condition, but now he, but he's also addressing and bringing up this idea of judging. And anytime we get into Scripture... I just want to give a principle. We talk about this sometimes. When you read something in Scripture and you have a verse that is potentially controversial, potentially not, any t I just, we should never base our whole theology on one verse, okay? So if you read something like, do not judge, and I've had plenty of people quote me and say, hey, do not judge, because the Bible, Jesus said, do not judge. So don't judge. Don't judge me. Don't judge what I do, because Jesus said, don't judge. But we want to all, anytime we have one verse in the Bible, we want to say, what does the whole Bible say about this? What are the other things that Jesus says about this so that we can understand this rightly? And so that's what we want to do here today because Jesus does say, do not judge. And I believe that that works for us today. It is an instruction, so we want to understand that better. First of all, the word judge that he uses here is a Greek word that says krino. So go ahead and say krino. krino. Just, you know, kind of get warmed up today. Since we're talking about judging, it's so much fun. So, yeah, krino. So this word krino actually means, uh, it, we have it for you, it's to separate or to discern. So you, you want to separate things. It's, it's a word that you will separate good and bad. You'll separate truth from untruth. And, and so this word krino is used about 137 times, to be exact, in the Greek New Testament. And when it's used, it, it has a bunch of different meanings, but always it's some sort of it's to separate or to discern. Sometimes when it's used, is it's, hey, discern for yourselves about this, or discern, you, you have to think for yourselves and make a decision. Sometimes it says that. But it also certainly can mean to judge in the sense that we understand judging. And there's two, word, two ways that it's most commonly used in form of judgment, and there's two that we really need to understand to get into this today. So there's two types of judgment. The first type of judgment when this is used is the condemnation of a person. The discernment, or, or so, so condemnation of a person. So the first part is separating out people based on uh, who they are, based on their character, their worth, their identity, and their significance. So condemnation or separating out of people. Now, I believe that in this passage, Jesus is leaning towards this, and we're going to show you plenty of verses to support it, to say, don't do this kind of crino, judging. 
separating out. I want to uh, illustrate that a little bit for you. In our American court system, we have, we have this common symbol here of justice. And I think it's more of a Hollywood symbol. I know it exists, but it's probably more on, on TV and in movies than in reality. But when I think of justice and separating out people and having a verdict, I think of, I always have this picture of this judge who, who hears the case, or maybe the jury hears the case, and then there's a sentence and says, okay, we've determined that you are guilty, and I sentence you to whatever it might be. I sentence you to life in prison. <laughs> Done. Done. You've been judged. Or you are, I, you, you are innocent, and you can now leave. <laughs> Done. And that's a, the kind of a form of judgment that I think of. Now, when Jesus is speaking of this crino here, this separating out of people, he's saying, hey, your job as people is not to sit there and decide who's in and who's out based on their character, based on their worth, to make decisions about their identity and their significance, because what you see is what you see. And I'm telling, and Jesus says, do not get involved in the judgment of separating out people by what you see. Now, I'm trying to make some of you uncomfortable here today, so we're going to get there. One way to think of it is, is often we judge others either consciously or subconsciously. We're actually giving ourselves worth by deciding that what they are doing or who they are is less value than what I do and who I am. We find worth when we can judge others. This is the root of things that are so egregious like racism. It's the root of that when just on the outside to determine somebody's character, their significance, their value, their worth by what you see. And the heart of that is all about trying to make yourself or your people, your tribe, to be better than them if they can be lower than you. And Jesus says, this kind of judgment has no business with you because you are imperfect people. You cannot make a perfect judgment. We often talk about and and allude back to Genesis chapter 3. It helps us understand all of our story of God. And and one of the things that we need to understand is humans were given one prohibition. It said, don't take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because you can't bear that. In other words, don't take for yourselves. Don't say you want to make judgments on people. Because you're not infinite. You don't have that infinite knowledge and power and you don't understand. So when you put yourself in the place of judgment, all of a sudden, we find all kinds of consequences. When you have the heart of sin is this not trusting that God can handle that. And so we find with judgment, we start to have jealousy and hate. And we start to treat other people poorly because we need to preserve ourselves and, and all of these things kind of snowballs from it. And so Jesus says, do not crino, separate out people. Don't be in the business of judging people. The heart that says, I'm glad I'm not them, or maybe at least I'm not them. Now, I hope everyone in here would agree that we don't want to judge people based on the way they look and what we see. But I think it gets a little more uncomfortable when we start to think, well, what about people and their lifestyles and their behaviors? What about, what about people who are here and uh, maybe they're from a different economic class as you? And we judge them when we see them walking down our street. How many of you pass no judgment when you see a homeless person walking through your neighborhood at night? You're just free. You're like, oh, I have no judgment for that person. Or do you put your guard up? How many of you have no judgment when you think of illegal immigration and illegal immigrants who live and work around us? And we put value on someone's life or we devalue their life based on what we see and know on the outside. Am I making anyone uncomfortable yet? I'm trying. How about, how about we place value and we make judgments about people based on where they get their news or fake news from or who they vote for or who they didn't vote for. And so they're in a camp. And if it's not yours, they're down here, you're up here. Because we're good at crinoing people, separating them out, are we not? It's natural to us. Jesus says, don't get in the business of this. I'm going to dig deeper into that in just a moment. But So that's one time is the condemnation of a person determining their character, their worth, identity, significance based on what we see. The other part of crino, though, 
is discernment of holiness within the church. Because the other question that comes up is, well then, if we never make a judgment, then do we have no moral standards? Can we never make a judgment about right and wrong? Can we never make a judgment about somebody be, how someone behaves or what they are doing? And the answer is, Jesus absolutely instructs us to do this, but in the context of the family of faith. Keep reading with me in Luke chapter 6. He just said, do not judge, do not crino and condemn people. Now in verse 39, he says he, sp- it says he spoke a parable to them. He said, a blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. He's talking to his disciples and say, hey, you're still blind. Let me, you need to learn more. You need to understand my ways, how I do things more. You need to understand the heart of God. And then look at verse 41. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take that speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. You see, in the same passage where Jesus says, do not judge, crino, condemn people, he said, okay, here's how you judge your brother. Here's how you discern and make a decision and help to keep this holiness within the church, within the family of God. And next week, we're actually going to take the rest of chapters, this thought in chapter 6 and talk about it more. Next week's title of the message is How to Judge Each Other. It's very practical. <laughs> because I think it's really important that we understand that too. But notice the difference. Jesus starts off and says, do not judge, do not condemn. And then in the very next breath, he says, when essentially you judge your brother, this is how you do it. Inside the family of faith, we can talk about this. Outside the family of faith, let that be up to God. Notice the difference here. One of these is we have condemnation of a person is one idea of crino, separate. The other is discernment of holiness within the family of God. They're very different. So Jesus is saying there's a judgment that is not about how to become a part of the family of God, but because you are already in the family of God. And it's very different. We often as humans like to switch that around. As Christians, we get this mixed up. We have no problem sometimes judging outsiders by their actions But those within the church, we all live under the grace of God. Isn't it interesting that it's okay once you're in the family to live under grace, but if you're outside the family, you got judgment. That's flipped. That's not how God works. That's not what we find in Scripture. That those outside the family, that's an issue between them and God, not you and them. That is not your business to look at them and say, the what you are doing now, you are out. You are guilty. He says, leave that to me. And then within the flock, it's different. So how do we know? So let's answer a couple questions then. How do we know that God judges anybody? Am I saying there's no judgment at all? Well, I'm going to give you a bunch of different verses. And if you're new with us today, I don't like to give you too many different verses on a Sunday morning so that you're trying to keep up, but it's important that we think through this thoroughly. So let me give you just a couple of times of when the word crino is used, in this case, in the form of judgment. And I have these on the screen for you to follow along. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul is writing and he says, but to me it's a very small thing that I may be examined or judged by you. Or by any other human court, in fact, I don't even judge myself, for I'm conscious of nothing except for myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. In other words, Paul says, hey, I don't care if you judge me, I don't even judge myself. But he said, but that doesn't make me innocent. Keep going, verse 5. There, uh, but the, the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment or crino, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring, bring both who will both bring to light the things that are hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Then each man's praise will come to him from God, not from each other. 
So Paul says, hey, guess what? There is a crino, there is a separation, there is a judgment that God will have on us, but whose is it? It's God's choice. He can look into the heart. He sees through the outer layers. He sees beyond what we see. But as far as humans judging, you're not gonna do a very good job with that. All right, next one, Romans chapter two. Romans chapter one is a passage that, that was written, and, and all this was written to Christians. Most of them were Jewish Christians, who, Jews who converted to Christianity. And so the book of Romans is, is this letter written to the church. Now, chapter one, a, a lot of people liked chapter one because chapter one says that when you look around, all creation speaks of the existence of God. So Paul's writing and says, so no one's without excuse. Because in the inner workings of our hearts, all mankind has some sort of sense that there's this creator or higher being. If you look at every culture from all times, you find that at some point, when we examine the, the, the mountains and the oceans and the sunsets and the longings of our heart, that most tribes across the existence of humanity have said there's got to be a higher power somewhere. And that's what Paul's arguing. He's saying everybody, no one has an excuse because God has revealed himself in many ways. But, he said in chapter one, but people like to exchange the truth of God for a lie and, we, and follow whatever they want. They want to live the life that they want to live to please themselves. Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. Does it sound relevant today? <laughs> this is a generation that's the me, me, me generation. I'm not talking about our young people. I'm talking about all of us. We have our iPhone, our iTunes. We have our iSpirituality. If it works for me, customize it for me. The homepage is mine. Every, let's make it work for me so that I'm happy and pleased. Paul said this is what people are doing, and as a result, they're exchanging the truths of God for a lie, and now they're being given over to their sinful desires. And he describes lives. He's like, hey, there's behaviors that are that just any kind of form of sin you can think of is what they're giving into. And that passage is not about one form of sin, by the way. So all the Christians who heard this said, that's right. Those outsiders who are sinners are guilty. Then Paul writes chapter two. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose, O man, that when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you'll escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance? See, Paul is saying, when you start looking at everyone else and their behaviors, and they're on the outside, and they are sinful because what they're doing... Paul says, oh yeah, and don't judge them to condemnation. Don't hold the gavel because you do the same things. Now you might say, no, I don't. I don't do the same things. My sins are pretty light, man. Come on, I don't do those things. Paul tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's really easy for us to judge other people's sins when they're not the sins we struggle with, is it not? I, I, I have no problem thinking that you should, li- you, that shouldn't be a struggle for you, you immature Christian, when it's not my struggle. But don't talk about the things that are my struggles. <laughs> See, we're very quick to judge the sins of others without dealing with our own. And, and Paul's saying, listen, if you're passing judgment, just know that you are guilty. You are guilty. Do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? Just because you can pronounce judgment on someone else, well, their sins are worse. No, don't crino. Don't separate out the people as if you have the standard. You're the golden standard. You're not. You're not. John chapter 12, verse 46, Jesus is speaking. Jesus says this in John chapter 12, verse 46. These are only a few verses. There's more. But he says this, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. 
For I do not come to judge the world, but to save it. Wait, what? Jesus isn't coming to judge us. Awesome. Okay. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. It's the word that I spoke is what will judge him on that last day. And he goes on to say that word that I spoke is coming from the Father in heaven. So Jesus says, I have come to give all people a chance. I haven't come to condemn you. I've come to bring life. But if you reject my words, you reject my forgiveness, you reject me, the Father in heaven is the judge ultimately. We hate that, don't we? We don't want anyone to be judged, or some of you want everyone to be judged. (laughs) Jesus says, no, I've come to bring life. Notice this principle here. Only God can judge people. The inward workings of their heart. Because only a perfect God can judge perfectly. And anytime we start getting in the business of deciding someone's worth and value and significance, we do that so that, because for some reason it helps us feel better. Often. When those people that we're judging are the ones that God says have indescribable worth. So much so that Jesus came to lay down his life for them. The murderer he came to lay down his life for. Those who are indulging in sexual immorality, he came to lay down his life for them. The illegal immigrant, Jesus came to lay down his life for them. When we start looking at people and saying, you don't have value, or I'm judging you for where you are, you're judging the person that Jesus says has indescribable worth, so much worth that he laid down his life for him. Greg Boyd once wrote this. He said, it's impossible to ascribe this worth to others when you're using others to ascribe worth to yourself. The Christian's job is to agree with God that every person you meet was worth Jesus dying for. Every person you meet is worth the death of Christ for their salvation. Every person. You tracking with me? I have a job next week? All right, let's go on. (laughs) So let's look at just a couple verses to whet your appetite for next week of the Christian's form of judgment. The judgment we can do. You want to know what you can do? Let's know how we can judge. That's fun. Hebrews chapter 5. I'm just giving you a few. You can judge each other all you want in here. Talk about it next week. (laughs) In Hebrews chapter 5, Paul, Paul, the writer of Hebrews, is writing and says that uh, you should be maturing in your faith by now, but you keep needing milk like little infants, but you need to mature and, and need the word of God, and, and, and to digest deeper truths of scripture. And in verse 14, in Hebrews, it says, solid food is for the mature, who because of the practice, of practice have their senses trained to discern, to crino, good and evil. See, the more you mature and you understand the words of God, the character of God, you can discern good and evil. And this is in the context of the family of faith. The other one I want to show you, uh, a way that we can judge each other, But you can't do it until after we talk about it next week. So you do it right. So Galatians chapter 6 starts off and says this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of hate. Oh, sorry. In the spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burden and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. He's saying when you look at one another's lives in the family of faith and you crino them, you judge, you you look into their lives, do it. Restore them. The goal is that you bring them up with a spirit of gentleness, bearing their burdens, not leaving them out there on their own. Not saying like, well, Mike, those Christians over there are terrible sinners. I'm going to hang out with the the not so terrible sinner Christians. (laughs) No, restore them with gentleness and bear their burdens. Carry their burden. One of the problems we have in the church, I'm about to preach, one of the problems we have in the church is that when we even speak against Christians in certain lifestyles, we don't offer them an alternative. We don't walk with them and provide the kind of intimacy and love that they need. 
We say, oh, until you clean up, you're out there. That's not bearing someone's burden. Okay, so that's next week. So how do we respond? What's our response today? Let me give you a few, uh, three practical things that I think will help us respond to all of this truth about judging. Three practical things. One, recognize your own need for forgiveness and grace. We cannot rightly approach this subject unless we first recognize our own need for God's forgiveness and grace. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, the wages of, uh, sorry, it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In our teaching team, we were talking about this, this verse, and we said, most of us, most Christians accept Romans 3.23. We accept it as truth, but it doesn't prevent us from comparing distances. We say, yeah, we've all sinned, but you've sinned worse. <laughs> See, but when we really come approach this issue, we need to approach it knowing that there, but by the grace of God, go I. That I am a sinner in need of God's grace and forgiveness as much as anybody else. The Apostle Paul was writing, and I think Paul is kind of the rock star of the Christian faith, right? He wrote most of the New Testament. He persecuted Christians. He hated Christians. He had this radical conversion. And now he's preaching and sharing Christ with everyone he meets to his own peril. He's, He's suffering, being tortured, thrown into prison. Eventually, he's killed for his faith. That's, that's a pretty high standard of Christianity. But in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, here's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's great. I agree. And then he said, of who I am the foremost... See, Paul, who has a heart for all people, he believes that Jesus comes and can redeem anybody. He says he comes to save sinners, but guess what? I am the foremost of all sinners. When I think of Paul, I say, you are not the foremost. I have met much worse sinners than you. You should see the kind of things that people come to me about at Seacoast. Paul, you're good, man. You're all right. I love it, though, because that's the approach. Paul gets it. We need to begin recognizing without God's grace, we're doomed. All of us. All of us. So we need to start by recognizing our own need for forgiveness and grace. Second one is this. Let's trust God to be fair and to be just with all people. Let's trust that God is fair and he is just. Trust that if there is evil that needs to be punished in the world, he eventually will punish it on his own terms, on his own timetable. Let's just trust that if God says he's God, that he is God. Is that, can we agree on that right here? And we can trust that he will take care of what needs to be taken care of. We need to have that approach that allows us to approach people who are against God, who hate God with a, with a heart of compassion and humility, knowing that ultimately it's not my business He hasn't asked me to execute his judgment on anyone. I trust that God's big enough to handle this. Also, part of that is this. Know that God loves others more than you ever could. He loves people so much more than you ever could love them. He looks at the the atheist who's trying to tear down the Christian faith, and his heart breaks. In fact, it breaks so much that he died on the cross for them. He died on the cross for the people who hate him. He died on the cross for those who we want to judge. So when we have this heart, say, God, we just trust that you you have this figured out. It frees us up from having to be judged. Isn't that freeing? I don't have to decide, well, what if that person never changes their ways? What if they never, what, what if they're always out there attacking you, God? What if they're, what if they're diluting the truth? What, what if they're doing that? And he says, don't, I love them so much. Let me take care of that. It's hard enough taking care of you, Ryan. Part of this is if we can take the time to know people's stories and see people as people, to actually hear them. It's amazing how that changes. Barry Corey of Biola University, the president of Biola University, uses this term, we need to have a firm center and soft edges. 
The idea is this, that there is a truth and a standard of truth that I hold to. I believe that what's written in this scripture, in this Bible, is it gives me a basis in which I can live my life. And I don't believe that this needs to change. I don't believe this truth needs to be updated. I think it's worked very well for thousands of years. And the truth is, if we lived it out exactly how God has laid it out for us, it would be a blessing not just to us, but to the whole world. There's a firm center that I personally in my own life do not believe is imp- that I ever should compromise. But we need to have soft edges. Think of Jesus when he approached the tax collectors and the sinners, the prostitute who came to him. She was outcast. She was unclean. She was mo- sexually immoral. And if others saw Jesus with her, what might they think? In fact, we know what they thought because they wrote about it in Scripture, and they called Jesus and said, oh my goodness, he's a tax, he's a drunkard, he's a partier. Look at the people he hangs out with. Jesus had a firm center, though. He didn't compromise truth, but he was with them because he had soft edges. He said, there is room in the kingdom of God for you. In fact, I came to give my life for you. Firm center, but soft edges We as a church need to have soft edges when we approach people. Hard edges don't help. And when we know people's stories, we know the inner workings of their life and their hearts, all of a sudden it's easier to be soft, is it? Is it not? Rather than just saying, you must be this way if you behave that way. If you live that way, you must. There's something wrong with you. Really? Do you know their story? Soft edges, firm center. So we want to recognize our own need for forgiveness and grace. We want to trust that God will be fair and just with all people, knowing that he loves them more than you do. And then finally, we want to live our lives under the rule and reign of Christ. We want to live our lives under the rule and reign of Christ. This, Jesus says all of this, you don't have to judge, you don't have to condemn, you don't have to do all that. If you take care of your own business and recognize you're living in the kingdom of God, you represent the kingdom of God, he is your king. If you live under the rule and reign of Christ, you be a blessing. You be the hands and feet of Jesus in your workplace, in your neighborhood, the places you shop. You let them see the character of God through you. And that makes a difference in the world. You can control that. We live for God's glory, that his name is on display, not ours. And when we live to put his name on display, we are so freed up. We can trust that he can use your life or not use your life. That's not up to you. But we live under the rule reign of Christ. I want to invite the worship team to start making their way up and leave you with a story here. There's a book called Good Faith. And if any of you want to dig a little deeper on this, uh, a guy named Gabe Lyons and Dave Kinnaman wrote this book called Good Faith. And uh, they're, they have a, basically the subtitle is Being a Christian in a World That Thinks You're Irrelevant. <laughs> so... It's, it's pretty appropriate. But they have a formula. They say we need to be people of love. People with plus have beliefs. Plus live it out. And that equals good faith. Live out your faith under the rule reign of Christ and let him take care of it. There's a story of a, a Christian writer who she lived out her faith. She was graduated at top of one of her classes as an amazing Christian author and writing journalist. She got a dream job working for the New York Times. In fact, she worked for David Brooks, who's a columnist, columnist for the New York Times, very successful. Not necessarily a Christian environment, but she brought her Christianity into this environment to say, how can I live my life under the rule reign of Christ to make a difference in this industry that is less than Christian? Well, David Brooks wrote a book later called Road to Character. And his book, Road to Character, Ann Snyder was a big part of helping him write the book. But if you look at the acknowledgments, he doesn't acknowledge her. He doesn't thank her when he thanks all the other people. But then you look at the beginning of the book, how it starts, and it says this. This is written by David Brooks. He writes, Ann C. Snyder was there when this book was born and walked with me through the first three years of its writing. This was first conceived as a book about cognition and decision-making. Under Anne's influence, it became a book about morality and inner life. 
She led dozens of discussions about the material. She assigned me reading from her own bank of knowledge. She challenged the superficiality of my own thinking in memo after memo and transformed this project. While I was never, while I was never able to match the lyrics of her prose or the sensitivity of her observations, I have certainly stolen many of her ideas and admired the gracious, morally rigorous way she lives her life. If there are any important points in this book, they probably came from Anne. Isn't that amazing how someone who says, my job is not to hold the gavel, to decide who's in and out, and to say, I am a child of the kingdom of God living under the rule and reign of Christ, and I will live out that rule and reign in this environment, in this world, and let God do what he needs to do with me, through me, around me. Let him be God. We're going to end our time with one final song, and let's just pray as we close out here. And I want to invite you to stand with me as we, as we pray. And my guess is, for some of you, maybe this pushed some buttons. Maybe it encouraged you. Maybe it challenged you. Maybe you've been online looking for another church in the area. Um, <laughs> we are committed to the truth, and I believe that this is truth from the Word of God, and truth is sometimes challenging. But we have so much freedom when we can trust that our God is God and I don't have to be and you don't have to be. That's the best way to live. So let's, let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the fact that you are God and the fact that when I was a sinner, when I was your enemy, when I was on the outside deserving to be separated, you welcomed me in. And so God, for anybody who's here or anybody we encounter throughout the week who's on the outside, God, give us soft edges and firm center, trusting that you love your creation and you want to invite them into relationship with you. And so let us be a part of that, God. Shape and change us. Help us let go of our own idols of self-righteousness and our own pet peeves and trust you to be king. We give you this time now.